Scientists and Lady Gaga agree. Poker faces are tough to read. In fact, well, scientists say that they're impossible to read because people just aren't very good at understanding what people's intentions are based on just looking at someone's facial expression. On today's episode of Life's Pollock Buffet, we're going to talk a little bit about why we call a poker face a poker face and why and how poker came about, well, as best as we know. And I will draw a card from our deck of 55 Life's Potluck Buffet cards in three suits to see what our advice for the day will be. I'm John Paulus. You're listening to Life's Potluck Buffet only on YouTube. If you've been enjoying Life's Potluck Buffet, please subscribe. And if you've already subscribed, thank you so much. I truly appreciate the support. And thank you for listening. Okay, first, that whole science of poker faces business. Now, scientists at Ohio State University in the United States have studied people's um, understanding of the intentions of others by uh, just seeing what um, the face they're making. And people have not been able to do that, actually, at all at all because there are many more things that are required than just facial expression to understand what a person is thinking. Now, we all know that from experience, but nonetheless, if you're me, you still try to do it and it doesn't work. Oh, by the way, there was also the concept, which I haven't, I hadn't heard of until today. There's the concept of poker talk and maybe you've heard of it, but this is like the talking equivalent of Poker Face. And actually, Poker Face and Poker Talk were the two key elements to the popularity of poker in, well, the 19th century when it first began to form into the card game of various variations that we now know as poker. Now, where does poker come from? Well, Everyone who has uh, studied the the history of poker uh, has come with to the to the same basic conclusion that somewhere in what was then the southwestern United States in the early 1800s, probably around the city of New Orleans and probably in a French speaking place. And I'll get to that why that is probably the case in a second. And it may have reached its final kind of form in places like, well, on steamboats that went up and down the Mississippi River, where because of the long travel times, the two main occupations that people had were basically reading or playing cards. And when cards got played on riverboats in the United States in the early 19th century, they were played for money. So there was a lot of gambling. In fact, the um, extent of the gambling is um, criticized a lot in moralizing books and articles in the 19th century. And also the whole uh, problem of the lack of libraries on steamboats is also brought up in the same context because certain authors thought, oh, well, if there were just more books to be read, then people would g- maybe gamble less. But th- the, the reason given for not having extensive libraries uh, normally, apparently, by the steamboat operators was that, well, people just walk off with the books, you know, they just put it in their bag or they just take it with them. And so we don't want to just like spend money on books just to have them disappear. But in fact, um, (laughs) the counter given by some of these moralizing authors is that they know that on riverboats um, in the east of the United States at that time, um, well, which is still the East of the United States now, uh, they uh, get, they had people provide a deposit so that they would lose their deposit of a couple of dollars um, if they took the book with them. I don't know if any steamboats ever adopted that particular policy and thus um, created more of a library on their steamboats. But nonetheless, gambling was still very popular on steamboats regardless of libraries. And... Of course, in the city of New Orleans, there were also 
many gambling establishments. And so it was really a kind of place where uh, a lot of different games are getting played. And when a lot of different games are getting played by people coming from all sorts of places around the world, you get these combination games and all of a sudden you get innovation and new games. And one of those new games would eventually be called poker. Poker comes from a tradition of what are called vying games. So these are games where you're not trying to complete a hand or to or, or the game doesn't end when some uh, something happens. It's a game where you're basically you have these things called showdowns where you basically show what cards you have and you're vying against your opponents to see who has the um, best hand um, based on the rules of the game. And that type of vying game also is perfect for um, gambling. And because of the um, involvement of poker face and poker talk, and the poker talk is basically uh, a kind of gamesmanship, um, and we have records of this from when the game comes over to um, England in the um, in the later in the 19th century and is is seen as an import from the United States and becomes very, very popular in England. Um, the uh, example of poker talk is um, not being um, really like quiet about your cards, but um, actually uh, saying things like, geez, what are you, did two are two what are two kings did those beat an ace and you, I, you know, things like that. And uh, you know, trying to psych out your, opponents and you know the, the the that's that's the idea of poker talk but meanwhile you actually have a pair of sixes and um, you know uh, you are what is called bluffing now bluffing is also a word that is from the world of poker because in the mid 19th century the publications on playing card games and games in general couldn't decide whether it should it was regularly called poker or bluff. Now the origins of bluff may be to the um, idea of making yourself big um, and uh, kind of um, boasting or bragging about your hand, and that 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 was actually a game that was one of the several predecessors of poker, a vying game, an English vying game called Brag. And you would, when you put down a bet in that game, you would say, I brag. And then you'd put your, your, how much, you know, your bet was. And so the idea of bluff may come from that kind of, um, what was seen as a kind of boasting about how good your hand was um, in these vying games. And it helps that, I think it helps that there's a Dutch word, bluffe, which is spelled like, bl well, it looks like bluffin, if you look at it, and you speak English and not Dutch. Um, and that word can mean to boast or to brag. And so that's an interesting possible connection, although there's by no means, it may be a simple coincidence. Now, where does the whole name poker actually come from? What game does that actually come from? The name comes probably from a French game called Poke. And that's spelled P-O-Q-U-E. And Poke is a French translation of the German game Poch, which, uh, and, and Poch in German, is from an old verb, pochen, which means to uh, uh, kind of uh, strike a blow um, or to, you know, to knock. Um, and so it was, um, there was, uh, there was a uh, kind of idea that like when you put your bet down, and there was a board in this, in this, in this game, um, and when you put your bet down, you know, you knock, it, you're kind of knocking. At least that's what people surmise about why 
Poch is called Poch. And then so it got played in France and it got turned into a game called Poch, which was had slightly different rules by the early 19th century. And it got played in what was part of France until 1803, and that's the Louisiana Territory, which was in the South, which when it became part of the United States, it became the southwestern part of the United States. Now, obviously, it's not even close to the southwestern part of the United States, but back then, it was the southwestern United States. Now, somewhere in that area, probably, in the early first decades of the 19th century, the game of poke got combined with a game like the the brag, that brag, the vying game that was brag in um, England. And there are others that are similar vying games that were thought to be um, the part of the mix here. And there were also games like the games the like flux, which involved a, a thing where you had three cards of the same suit. And that's where we get our word for flush in poker, when you have cards, five cards uh, of the same suit, for example. That was a later addition, um, as was the thing like called, called the straight, the sequence of cards. But there were various games that had these elements, and it all got combined in the United States to form a game that, by the mid-19th century, would be called uh, poker. Now, the reason it's called poker with an R instead of just poke is probably because of the dialectical variants of English in, the, in Louisiana, for example, in New Orleans especially, where you have dialects of English that don't pronounce an R. And when that happens, R's get added as a kind of hyper correction or an excessive correction by speakers who speak dialects that tend to knock R's off of words. They also then add R's to words that don't have R's. So that's the whole thing where you hear someone say something like idea or diplomer. And that probably had is it, that's what people think happened with the name poke because the way it was probably pronounced was something like poke. And then when people hypercorrected, they said poker. And so that's probably how we got to where we are today, saying poker. And interestingly, in places that do cut off R's in um, English dialects, uh, poker is the way you pronounce it. So it kind of returned to its, it returns to its original pronunciation sometimes in certain dialects of English around the world. But because of poker, we have all of these words that developed in the 19th century, like bluffing. In other words, betting a lot when you don't have a very good hand. And we have words like poker face, not showing your intentions or what hand you have by making a reaction with your face. And we have poker talk, which I still have only heard it once today. So maybe you have heard it before. If you have, let me know in the comments. But poker talk being a kind of boastful talking to kind of psych out your opponents about what your hand is, or maybe vice versa. Who knows? Uh, nonetheless, it's part of the game. And in the 19th century, it was seen as part of the the key fun of poker was, and still today, is the whole psychological element of it. And also that led to very large betting because in order to psych out your opponent, there's no better way than to lay a big bet on the table. And that also got criticized a lot in these moralizing books and and articles about how poker was a, a bad thing for society, uh, saying that it favored the person simply with the most amount of money because they could scare away anybody by laying down a really big bet. And that wasn't just seen as not sporting. It was also seen as a sign of an evil character. And so poker came under a lot of scrutiny in the 19th century, even as it became more popular than ever around the world.
okay, so let's draw just one card. We won't we won't draw five cards as eventually the uh, the, the main form of poker um, became in in the nineteenth century. Uh, we won't draw five cards. We will draw uh, one card to see what our hand is for today. So yellow lemons, blue dumplings, magenta noodles, cards. Tell us some things. It's card 16. Turn your greatest weakness into your greatest strength. Oh, I, I just drew this the other day. So the guy, in case you forgot, the guy who wrote Robert's Rules of Order, and Robert was the guy's last name. It's not his like first name. Yeah, his first name was Henry. So the guy, Henry, who wrote Robert's Rules of Order wrote them because he couldn't run a meeting that he needed to run because he didn't know how to keep the meeting in order. Oh, and it was around the same time that the rules of poker as we know it today were also kind of being put into books. And that is um, really neat because I guess this card is a perfect, uh, perfect historical timing for today's episode. So think of something that you consider a really big weakness, maybe your greatest weakness, and then become proficient, get good at that weakness. And you will find that it will be a source of flourishing and of pride for you. So give that a try today, and I'll see you tomorrow on Life's Potluck Buffet. (laughs) 